This is the World Organic News for the week ending 20th of November 2017. John Moore reporting. This week we begin with a call for change. It's a post entitled Antibiotics in Agriculture, We Can't Afford It. From the blog, The Microbial Life. Way back in the olden days of the 1950s or thereabouts, one trial concluded that antibiotics as part of a feeding program for proto-factory farmed animals finished them earlier and in a healthier condition than if they weren't fed antibiotics as part of a standard diet. The key word in the previous sentence is one, one trial. As far as I can find in the literature, the effect reported in this study has never, to anywhere near the same extent, been replicated. So what happened? The antibiotics producers seized upon the findings of this one study and pushed their product as an answer to world hunger. A laudable aim, but it's based upon one non-replicated piece of work. If that were the only issue, then maybe we could live with the economic dysfunction caused by a false belief in one paper. But there are other consequences from the routine dousing of our food with antibiotics. From the Post. Quote, For Global Antibiotics Awareness Week this year, I want to focus on antibiotics and agriculture. This is not what we generally think of when we first discuss this issue, but it should be. According to the US FDA... 80% of all antibiotics used in that country are used in agriculture. 2009 FDA report, end quote. The thing with antibiotics and bacteria is that they are in a constant war. Those bacteria attacked by the antibiotics are under an evolutionary pressure to survive the attack from these pharmaceuticals. The less they are exposed to the evolutionary pressure, the less chance they have of resistance, or evolving resistance. To put that another way, if a bacteria is attacked by an antibiotic, some individuals die immediately, some a few days into the course of the medication, and all or nearly all by the end of the course of the medication. The nearly all part is important. Our immune systems generally deal with the bacteria left over from the nearly all. The antibiotics wash out of our system and the bacteria are gone. When a living animal is constantly washed in antibiotics, their immune system systems have less to do the remaining surviving bacteria reproduce within the context of an antibiotic background and continue to build resistance to that antibiotic. This is a numbers game. Most of the bacteria and most of the animals will not develop antibiotic resistance. But, and this is a big but, very occasionally a small population of bacteria will develop some resistance. The best way to increase their numbers is to kill off any competitors with antibiotics. So what? Well, the same bacteria affect meat animals, dairy animals and humans. You know, us. True enough, the TB that infects goats does not affect humans, but the TB in badgers and cattle do infect humans. As I said, it's a numbers game. All evolutionary processes are a numbers game. So let's see how many pigs, chooks and cattle are produced every year in, let's say, the US, shall we? According to Purdue University, 8 billion chooks are consumed each year. 115 million pigs, according to the National Pork Producers Council of the USA, and according to the US National Cattlemen's Beef Association, there are 93.5 million head on the ground. If only half of these are fed antibiotics routinely, we end up with 4,115 million, or in some countries, 4.115 billion. Individual experiments in developing antibiotic resistance. And that's just in the USA. The EU has banned the use of antibiotics in food, as has New Zealand. But surely this needs to be the case across the globe. On a happier note, we have a post entitled Ground Operations. From Veteran to Sustainable Farming, from Life and Soul magazine. Quote, Ground Operations, Battlefields to Farm Fields is a documentary film that showcases US veterans who are becoming organic farmers and revitalising their communities with access to local, affordable, fresh and healthy food. The film, which highlights the growing number of veterans returning home who are affected by PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, shows how they are reclaiming their lives, regenerating soil and rural communities and restoring local access to fresh food, end quote. This is indeed a good news story. I would argue that we don't need to be suffering a severe mental health issue to benefit from getting our feet on the soil and our hands in the dirt. There is something healing about the whole process of food production which is yet to be fully investigated academically. 
I still have the one square metre garden handout available for those of you who wish to start small. There's a link in the show notes. The post has a trailer for the film and a link to purchase the full 40-odd minute video. To continue our increasing focus on the gen- from the general to the particular this week, we have two posts from the blog Delta Worms, maintaining a worm bin and harvesting a worm bin. Quote, Feed your worms about a quart or a pound of food scraps per square foot of surface area in your bin per week. To avoid common problems like fruit flies and odours, always bury food under the bedding. Don't dump and run. Be sensitive to overfeeding. If the bin starts to smell or the food isn't breaking down quickly, give your worms a break and feed them less food. Worms reproduce quickly, so they should be able to eat all the food if there's enough space and you increase the amount of food gradually. End quote. As with all livestock, feeding is critical. Too much and we are wasting feed and breeding disease. Too little and the stock are stressed. Just right and the system is in balance. From the second post on harvesting, quote, Harvest worm compost at least once every year to keep your worms healthy. You can start harvesting two to three months after you set your bin, after your bin set up, end quote. The post goes on to discuss four ways to harvest. One, toss a handful of the worm farm, worms and all, on your garden bed. Two, migration. Move the feeding area and the worms will follow, allowing you to collect the castings relatively worm-free to be then spread on your garden beds. Three, straining. Use a sieve to collect the worms and allowing the castings to fall through for use in garden beds. And four, piles. This involves scraping the top off of piles of worm castings and allowing the worms to bury themselves more deeply as the pile reduces. Eventually, the removed castings will be worm-free and the worms can be returned to the bins and the castings spread. I've employed all these methods and find number four to be the most effective. And I'm also able to check the health of the worms as I'm doing it. Once you have your worm castings, what do you do with them? Spreading them on garden beds is a good start. But I've also used castings and worm castings alone to build raised beds. This may seem extreme, but I had plenty and decided to give it a whirl. There is nothing like starting with a bed of gardening rocket fuel. And that's exactly what a raised bed full of worm castings is. The blog, Allotted Time, brings us a post building our beds. Quote, We decided to use some of the old white wood to build ourselves another raised bed. Admittedly, this was pretty ancient wood and in places it was really quite rotten. But we decided to remove the worst bits and create a bed a little higher than the pallet one. It is also a little longer too, which is great as the different bed sizes give us a bit more room to manoeuvre regarding the different things we want to grow. It would be a bit pointless to have identical beds everywhere, seeing as we're probably going to need different amounts of stuff, end quote. And this raises an interesting point. Whilst identical le- beds may look good on some level, nature rarely, if ever, produces identical units of production. On reflection... I can't think of anything except identical multiple births where nature creates exact copies. Maybe at the bacterial level, but who knows. Anyway, I like the idea of differing gardening beds this post suggests. They may just be making a virtue of a necessity, but equally they may have stumbled upon something really important. And that brings us to the end of this week's episode. A transcript is available at www.worldorganicnews.com slash 61597 slash 89. There's a link in the show notes. Thanks for listening, and I'll be back at the same time next week. <laughs>